Hello everybody, welcome back to Off Meta Musings, where today we're going to be talking about the Death Faction. I've done it. I finally managed to get through the entire list of Death Factions, doing list building for all of them. So here's kind of a compilation video for you guys. You can see every single one of the videos that I put together for Death, all in one convenient place for you. So you don't have to go trawling through my now hundreds of videos worth of back catalog. I hope this is going to be useful to you. As always, if you like what you see, please don't forget to like and subscribe and let me know down in the comments section below if you have any interesting death builds i'd be more than happy to hear them and more than happy to have a good discussion about them as always if you want to see more content like this if you do want to give me some extra support you can join me on youtube you can join me over on patreon if you want to see some behind the scenes content maybe you want early access to my videos or maybe you want to have a say in the kind of content that i make going forward or alternatively if none of that is for you you can give me some support over on streamlabs uh, anyway yes Without further ado, let's talk about death. Let's get into the videos. Okay, so we're going to start with Soul Black Grave Lords. Arguably, they are the best faction in the game. Their chaff units, because they're all movement three, they benefit massively from the tax that most Warcry fighters uh, pay on their movement. So in effect, they all get a pretty hefty points reduction just for that. They have a number of very good chaff options. They've got skeletons. They've got Graveguard, they've got Zombies, which are also very good. They've got some very good Bladeborn options in terms of the Sons of Valmorn. What this means is that most builds are effectively viable because you can spend 500, 600 points worth of anything and still get in there a solid core of five, maybe six skeletons or graveguard. So yeah, that makes them very versatile and it makes them very strong, especially on objective games and treasure missions where they can kind of gum up the board and use their very good support pieces to lock down the opponents. I mentioned that they're, they're movement three already, but that's kind of really not the case. Most of their fighters are going to be looking at having additional movement abilities of their own, or if not, what you can do is you can ally in something maybe from Flesh Eater Quartz to get more bonus movement. When you're writing your lists, they write like a movement three warband, so you get a lot of guys, but in effect, when you're playing, they're not a movement three warband. So, like I've said, they got a lot of really good fighters. Probably the, the, the highest impact one is we're going to look at the Grave Guard with Great White Blade. It's 65 points. It is 10 wounds, which is real good. But look at that damage profile, 3, 5, 2, 4. It's a lot of damage for just 65 points. And those 10 wounds is just enough to keep it alive and to enable it to do the damage that you want it to do. All of their chaff fighters, they all have the minion room mark and they all get shambling horde as a double. So the fighter can use this ability if they're within six inches of a visible friendly fighter with the faction room mark of soul like grave lords and the hero room mark. And this fighter gets a bonus move action up to a number of inches equal to the value of this ability. So your basic guys are gonna be able to use bonus moves we're going to see some of the stuff that we can ally in to give them extra movement. So it really allows you to capitalize on your very cheap core fighters and get them where they need to be to bring that very good 2-4 damage, mostly winning on threes to bear. Next up, I'd like to talk about the Vargoil. The Vargoil is 260 points, so it's one of your more expensive support pieces. It's got a 4425 damage profile, which is pretty good. Movement 8, which is good. It has the flying room marks. So we can get where it wants to go. And it's got 32 wounds. So it's very scary. It can fly about the place. And generally, it's one of your more efficient damaging fighters in the faction. All heroes, something I do want to mention, get the Summon Undead Minions ability. It's had a little bit of a nerf earlier on in the year. But effectively, what it allows you to do is you're allowed to bring back fighters with the minion rune mark it's a resurrect they gave graveguard the elite rune mark and the difference is if you're bringing back a fighter without the elite rune mark they come back with their full allotment of wounds and if you want to bring back a fighter with the elite rune mark um, they come back with the amount of wounds on the value of the dice uh, what this also means with the summoning changes is that your Graveguard and your Skeletons that you do bring back are not going to be able to do anything on the turn that they are resurrected, so they can only really start to work from the next turn. Um, previous to this change, what you would see is Warbands with not all that many Graveguard. You could take three or four, and that would be more than enough because you could run them at your opponent 
and then resurrect them and then they can carry on fighting. Now you're seeing warbands with far more Graveguard because of their limited ability to come back to life. Or you're going to be seeing warbands go in the far opposite direction with a lot more skeletons because skeletons are resurrected with their full allotment of eight wounds. And if they have shields and spears, for example, then they're going to have that toughness for. Moving on to the Vampire Lord. Again, pretty good damage profile. 4426. That's six crit damage is very nice. It's only 225 points. Movement five, fly, which is nice. 25 wounds, which is good. Toughness five, which is a step up from the Vargoyle. So really between the two, you kind of choose which kinds of hero that you want. Personally, I prefer the Vampire Lord over the Vargoyle. Yes, it's a little bit slower. Yes, it's got a lot less wounds, but it's much cheaper. Moving into lists, this is a tried and tested list. It is tournament winning. It did very well at Warhammer Fest that happened earlier on in the year. We are talking about a Vargoyle, which we've already said. We're going to be allying in an abhorrent Arc Regent. The Arc Regent has the Bringer of Death triple, which, like I said, is a movement buff. You can add half the value of the ability to the movement characteristic of friendly fighters within six inches of the arc region which is real good the arc region itself is also no slouching combat 4435 very good very solid damage profile we got three grave god with great weapons we got a grave god with a shield three skeletons with spears and two zombies and um, rounding out with the dire wolf as one of your thralls it is deceptively fast. It's got a bunch of high movement fighters through the vampires, through the Vargoyle and the Direwolf itself. And of course, it's got the movement boosting abilities themselves. So it can really get across the board and go to where it's going to go. And the Grave Guard themselves, they provide all the damage you need from your chaff fighters, whilst your skeletons and your zombies can tie up objectives and tie up treasure. It's real good. I played against this list a bunch of times. It's only 12 fighters. I, I say only. <laughs> it's very easy for Soul Black Grave Lords to hit 15 fighters. But 12, I feel, is... It's it, it's enough. It's enough fighters to be able to, to do exactly what you want in terms of objectives whilst keeping the damage up from your key fighters like your Vargoy or like your, your vampires. So yeah, it's real good. And it's really versatile. One of the questions that you might have is, okay, if Soul Black Grave Lords are so good... If I just wanted to pick them up for casual games, how would I build? Because you could have a whole bunch of skeletons, you could have a whole bunch of Grave Guard for not a lot of points, and it's still not a great experience for your opponent, especially if you're playing on objective or treasure missions. They have a bunch of less optimal fighters. You've got stuff from Cursed City, for example. You've got the Kosogi Night Guard. You've got things like the Varg Skier that you might want to consider bringing. They are not as good as some of the better things, but you can kind of counter that by still having your core of skeletons and your core of Grave Guard. So that might be something that you want to check out. You can use Divine Blessings, actually, to make Night Guard pretty decent. They're two attacks to begin with. They have a lot of wounds. They have 30 wounds for the amount of points you're paying. But if you give them an extra attack, suddenly they become pretty good and they become pretty decent kind of anchors that still have the ability to counterattack if they're charged. Going into Ossiarch Bone Reapers, again, they are one of the better Warcry factions. It's mainly down to the ability of very cheap chaff with 10 wounds and with toughness 5. They get some very good damage from the Cropolis Stalkers and from your Morgoth's Harbingers or your Archai. So they, I mean, if you've seen my video on Flesh Eater Quartz, they're kind of a bit like that. They play with a lot of little guys with a bunch of big guys to do the damage and to do the supporting. They have a generally pretty poor hero lineup, but they do, from their heroes, get the longest ranged movement ability in the game. So even taking their cheapest guys, you still bring some utility to the battlefield. They get access to, of course, all the death allies and all the death bladeborn. So you can plug those tactical gaps uh, that you might have. Looking at some of the fighters of interest here, I've chosen a bunch of guys that I think represent the best or the most efficient options that you can take. Starting with Necropolis Stalkers with the Spirit Blades. There are a couple of different flavors of Stalkers. I think the Spirit Blades is better. Five attack, strength four, two five damage profile, very good. Movement five, real good in a faction of otherwise movement three fighters. It's only 200 points. It's got 28 wounds. So you can put out a lot of damage for those points that you're paying. 
And of course, uh, if it wants to get into the fight a little bit easier, it does have a bonus move double if they're within six inches of an enemy fighter. So all round, I think they're solid. They'll do the damage um, that you want them to do. More Tank Guard themselves, this is really where the strength of Ossiarch Bone Reapers is. They are 55 points, 10 Wound Toughness, 5 Chaff, real good. They've got a couple of different flavors. You have the option to take Spears. The Spears have one less attack, but they have Crit 5. So Crit 5 is pretty good, but with that less attack and considering that you really want to push into the strengths of your Mortec Guard, which is going to be those shields with the Toughness 5, I would generally leave the Spears at home. And they also have Great Blades, which is a 2-4-2-4 damage profile. It's okay, it's just not as good as the Grave Guard with their Strength 5. If they had Strength 5, then yeah, possibly that might be something you want to look at. If they had three attacks like the Grave Guard do, then that's also something you might want to look at. But yeah, overall, I think Nandrite Blades are a fine choice. And looking at the Ossiarch Bone Reaper heroes, like I said, they're pretty poor. So generally, I'd be looking at just bringing a Mortec Hecatos. The Hecatos is 105 points. It is the leader of your Mortec Guard. And because it's cheap, it really allows you to focus on your other fighters. The Hecatos, along with the rest of your heroes, do get the Unstoppable Advanced Triple, which is actually pretty good. So until the end of the battle round, you had half the value of this ability rounding up to the move characteristic of friendly fighters that are in the same battle group as this fighter. So if it's in your shield, it will give the bonus move to everyone else in your shield, regardless where they are on the battlefield. So they can be on the other side of the battlefield, they could be anywhere really, and Unstoppable Advance is going to give you that movement buff. It's the longest movement buff in the game. It can affect anyone from anywhere. You might want to consider putting your Hecatos into the same deployment group as maybe your Necropolis Stalkers to give them that extra move because they'll be going off and they'll be fighting wherever they are and they want to free up their attacks and their abilities um, to do more damage in combat. Or alternatively, you might want to put it in there with your Mortec Guard um, to get them to move around the battlefield. For the list here, I'd like to show off again my reaction control list. I talked about this before in a video that I did a long while ago around reaction control and what you could do with counter and how you could build for that. Just to look at the list itself, we're looking at Mortec Hecatos because he's cheap. King Morlac here, we're going to be allying in the Sons of Velmorn. You got Jedren, Helmar, Thane. I've put in a Dreadblade Harrow here. He's 235 points. The Dreadblade is really there to give an extra move and to give that resurrect on anyone who's died in your warband. He's also got the Teleport Triple, which allows him to go places and get treasure very easily, which is something that I feel that a generally slower warband like this um, could really benefit from. So yeah, I like the Dreadblade Harrow. I think it's a decent option in this list. And then on top of that, we got four Mortec Guard with Nandrite Blades. Damage doesn't matter on your Mortec Guard because you can counter with that Toughness 5, so that's very good. King Morlac offers resurrection of his own fighters, and he gives a pretty good damage profile, actually, 4425. Helmar and Thane, of course, they are Graveguard, so they get all of the benefits that Graveguard themselves do, and they have their own attack boosting double that they can use if and if their other one has attacked. That's called Sibling Rivalry. Now, I like Jedrin, but some people don't like him. He's basically the most tanky skeleton alive he's got like those 30 wounds and he's got the toughness five and he's got decent damage and he's got his ability to make it so that king Vor king more like he can't be attacked but i know that some people don't like him so you have some options in there you can drop jedrin who's 150 and if you feel like you're not going to need the drip blade harrow you can drop that as well that opens up 385 points um to buy a bunch of replacements now what would you want to take I think due to the cheap chaff, obviously Arc Bone Reapers are really spoiled for their heavy hitter options, depending on what you want. You could take a Viable for 285, that's very good. He's got his bonus attack triple, which gives him a very good move then attack ability. So you can move in there, use your triple, get plus three attacks, swing for six on a 535 damage profile, which is real good. You've got your Necropolis Stalkers again, if you wanted something a little bit cheaper, though maybe not as maneuverable. Though Necropolis Stalkers do have their free move double if they're within six inches, so that's also very good. Uh, alternatively, Morgast Harbingers are pretty good. The Harbinger, I feel, is a very good 
in-house alternative to the Vorbolf. Again, 3-5, three, 3-5 five, three, five damage profile. Movement 8, just like the Vorbolf. Toughness 4, just like the Vorbolf. 35 wounds, just like the Vorbolf. What the Harbinger has over the Vorbolf is that it's got a bonus move action on a triple from Unbridled Ferocity. So it really depends on what you think you're going to be fighting and how you want to build. And you can use the plus one attack, Divine Blessing, on either your Morgast or your Vorbolf. Give them both four attacks, make them much more efficient and consistent in combat. You're effectively increasing their damage potential by a third for only 25 points. It does make them expensive, but you know, with the, those 35 wounds, they should be able to survive for long enough to bring that damage to bear. Moving on to Flesh Eater Quartz. Flesh Eater Quartz have a bunch of things going for them. They're really typified that small guys boosted by big guys playstyle, and um, that's the kind of warband that you're going to be bringing. Your basic ghouls themselves, they are movement 5, which is very good. They only have 8 wounds and toughness 3, but they're 55 points. So you can take a lot of them, and that's really what you're able to do. You're kind of playing almost like Soulblight Gravelords in that case, where you have a lot of chaff, and you've got a bunch of big dudes who's going to be doing the damage and going to be supporting your level guys. We've already talked about Chosen of the King. Those combos are very strong, allowing you to put a lot of damage where you need to. You get a number of high damage pieces from things like your Vampires and from your Vargulf and from your Crypt Haunters. Um, but something I do want to say, your Movement 10 Fighters, so your big ghouls with the wings, um, they're all very much overpriced for the damage potential. So... What that kind of leads to is a faction that has a decent amount of good fighters, but a lot of excess stuff that you're basically never going to be bringing. So a lot of the combos and a lot of the fighters that you're going to be seeing will kind of be a bit samey across your lists. They don't have the depth that Soul Black Gravelords do, for example, where just everything is good. So that's something to bear in mind when you're building your Flesh Eater Corpse lists what the best fighters are and what you're going to be using them for. So number of fighters of interest here. I'm going to start with the Vargulf Courtier. He is 285 points, so very expensive, but he has 35 wounds, which is great. He's got fly, which is great. He's got movement eight, which is also really good to get there. His damage profile is very good. He's got a triple terrifying frenzy, which has three to the attacks of a next melee attack action made by this fighter. What that allows you to do is use your move to get into combat, Use Terrifying Frenzy and attack with six attacks, and normally he's going to kill um, whatever it is he comes up against, which is very good. He's going to be wounding on threes most of the time. The Vargulf is one of probably, if not the most common Flesh Eater Court ally that you'll see in death. Looking at the two vampires, you've got the Abhorrent Ghoul King and the Abhorrent Arc Regent, depending on what you want to go. Ghoul King is decent, Arc Regent is better. Uh, it just depends on how many points you have to spend. The Arc Regent itself, 4-4, four, 3-5 four, damage profile, which is very good. We've got the movement 5 on there again. We've got 25 wounds again, which is pretty good for 205 points, if you ask me. I mentioned already that he has a triple bringer of death where until the end of the battle round, you're going to be adding half the value of this ability rounding up to the move characteristic of friendly fighters when they start move actions within six inches of this fighter. Six inches is a very long way, and with a high enough bringer of death, uh, your basic guys are movement five anyway, so you can get potentially a lot of extra move out of your Arc Regent and out of your Ghoul King. Finally, I wanted to show the Crypt Horror. It's got a 4424 damage profile, which is... Fine, it's 185 points though, which makes it actually fairly cheap with those 28 wounds and the movement 6. The Crypt Horror is able to use Chosen of the King, so it can get those extra attacks in there, which is very good. If you wanted a bit more punch, you can look at the Crypt Haunter. It's a few more points, it's got one extra point of crit on there, and it's got a bunch of extra wounds. But in reality, the Crypt Horror is the more efficient of the two fighters. It doesn't take up any hero slots, so it frees up the ability for you to take allies. As a list here, this is basically a tournament winning list. It's got all the best stuff that we talked about we've got the Vargulf, we got the ghoul king we got a pair of crypt horrors which opens up chosen of the king plays the abilities themselves don't conflict with each other 
Chosen of the King is on a double, Terrifying Frenzy of the Vargulf is on a triple, so it's not like it's very triple hungry where your fighters are going to be competing um, for those dice. Effectively every turn you should be able to make a triple, you should be able to make a double using your wild dice and whatever else it is that you roll. On top of that it's got plenty of damage potential and it plays the objective game nicely with those extra ghouls. Now it's not the biggest warband that you could bring. It's only seven guys. Um, it's also got no resurrection because we're not bringing in a night haunt hero. We are already using basically the most point sufficient fighters in the list. Um, but I kind of feel like to expand on this and maybe to make it a little bit better, um, what we would want is more of an ability to crack open those higher toughness targets. Uh, we've got a lot of 4424 4, damage profiles. Um, so even with Chosen of the King boosting those amount of attacks, you're still then be wounding on fours or fives most of the time. So looking into that, how do we boost what we already have while still keeping the numbers kind of at a reasonable level? And I think that the Wielder of the Blade is where we can go here. We're going to be allying that in from Night Haunt. We talked about the Wielder of the Blade already. If you give it the Blessing of Ferocity for plus one attack, it's actually better than the base damage profile of the Vargulf. But the important thing is, is that it's 85 points cheaper than a Vargulf. It's still got fly, just like the Vargulf does. It's a couple points slower, but it brings a whole bunch of interesting abilities to the table. It brings its kind of pseudo net ability. It brings its extra move double. It brings resurrection, which is very good. And it brings the basic Night Haunt double. Of course, it's not as survivable. So what are we going to do with those extra 85 points that we get? Um, I think that we can bless our Crypt Horrors with the Blessing of Brutality. Brutality is plus one base damage uh, on the attacks. So I think with a 4-4-3-4 damage profile, suddenly we're looking at doing a lot more damage, especially when we're going to be com combining that with Chosen of the King. And suddenly what you have in that case is four proper high damage fighters with a lot of mobility in there. Remember the Haunters are movement six. The Wielder of the Blade is movement 6 with Fly. The Arc Regent is movement 5, but it's still got the damage going for it. So this is the kind of thing that I would play, and I think it's pretty good. Whether it's better or it's worse than the previous list, that kind of remains to be seen. But yeah, I think using the ally system and using Blessings, you can really do some interesting things with Flesh Eater Quartz. I think just by having 55-point ghouls, it opens up the ability to bring in a lot of different allies and still have enough guys that you'd be able to run a, a solid functioning list. Right, so we're going to start with Royal Beast Flayers. They were released in Nightmare Quest. The idea behind them is that they are a fairly swarmy warband. They're fairly fast. Everything has at least movement 5 on it, which is very good. They've got very good mobility abilities. They have a couple of units that have inbuilt extra movement buffs for them so that really helps them get in and around pieces of treasure and objectives that kind of thing but that being said they are fairly fragile your basic ghouls are going to be sitting there with only eight wounds and toughness three to them and some of your more damaging pieces aren't really that much that much tougher than your basic guys so i feel like just by looking at the list they could really do with some kind of hard hitting ally to plug that damage gap and to kind of complement the numbers that they can already put on the board. Looking at the fighters of interest, I've picked out here the Royal Flame Master and the Beast Flayer Baron. Of course, they are a bespoke warband, so they don't have an amazing amount of fighters in the first place, but I feel like these two are the ones you're really going to be building around. The Flame Master is your hero choice. He's got three attacks at strength four with a 3-5 damage profile. So the damage profile isn't terrible. 3-5 is pretty good, but with only three attacks and only at strength four, you might find that he has a, bit, a little bit of a hard time when he comes up against some tougher fighters, maybe Stormcast, maybe fighters with Toughness 5, where he's basically stuck almost crit fishing for that 5 damage. What you can do with him is use your Divine Blessings, get him an extra attack in there. Suddenly he becomes a 4-4-3-5, which is a much bigger improvement. He only goes up to 200 points, which is not all that much to pay when you're thinking about the leader of your warband, so I think that's pretty good. His whole shtick and his whole gimmick is his ability Pack Tactics. Now, Pack Tactics is a triple, and the idea is you can pick a visible fighter 
to the Royal Flame Master. So that can be basically anywhere on the board as long as you can see them. And then what you're going to be doing is you're going to be allocating a number of damage to that fighter equal to twice the number of friendly fighters with the Beast Flayer's room mark within three inches. So the idea is if you have a bunch of ghouls, let's say you've got three ghouls within three inches of a fighter that you want to target with pack tactics, you can activate your Flame Master and you can do six points of damage. And it really adds up. I had a game recently where I was running Night Haunt. I had 10 wound fighters on the field. And what my opponent was doing was running in with the ghouls, doing a little bit of damage in there. Generally, it's not going to be enough to kill an enemy fighter, but what you can then do is use pack tactics to finish things off. And I think a ranged four or maybe six damage is actually pretty good um, as a triple, especially if you can use it at the right time. So I really like the Flame Master. I think it's very useful. You're always going to bring one anyway. The second fighter that I wanted to point out is your Beast Flayer Baron. Beast Flayer Baron is 115 points. It stats a fine 3, 4, 2, 4 damage profile, so very average. It does have toughness 4 and 16 wounds. The 16 wounds, I feel, go a long way to keep it alive, along with that toughness 4. But the real reason that you are taking it is for its Sound the Hunt double. And Sound the Hunt is you pick a number of fighters equal to half the value of the ability. Those fighters have to be within 3 inches of your Beast Flayer Baron. And then what those fighters get to do is they get a free move up to the value of the ability. Any kind of movement ability is always very useful um, in Warcry, especially one that will move the full value of the ability and that activates multiple fighters. Uh, because what that really allows you to do is get extra action economy in there. Every two fighters you're able to move with this ability effectively means that you get almost one extra free activation, especially when you're going to be playing a lot of fighters anyway. It really helps you out activate your opponent get to places where you need to be and to be very economical with the remaining actions that you might have. Now I said already that the faction itself is fairly squishy, it doesn't have an amazing amount of damage, so ideally you'd want to bring in a fighter to kind of help you out there using the ally system. You've got fighters in faction like the Offal Hound, but I don't think the Offal Hound brings enough to the table. I think it's pretty expensive, mainly because it's paying a lot for that movement. So here what I've thought about is as an ally, you've got a few routes to go. And the route I quite like at the moment is the Wielder of the Blade. Wielder of the Blade has been released very recently in the Headsman's Curse. So he will be a Bladeborn fighter that you can bring in. He is Night Haunt, so he's going to have Fly. But what you can do if you're using Divine Blessings, you can pay your 25 points, make the Wielder of the Blade 200, and give him his extra attack. And with his extra attack, he becomes a 3536 which is very strong for the points that you're paying, especially considering that he's going to have fly. He's got high movement of six anyway. He's got 20 wounds built in. So for 200 points, that's not terrible. It's just like any other one of the bespoke leaders. He brings a bunch of different abilities to the table, which I think are very interesting. To begin with, he's got the Swift Judgment double, which kind of ties into what I was saying about the Beast Flayer Baron. Swift Judgment allows you to make a bonus move action up to the value of the ability. You have to end your move closer to the nearest enemy fighter. But unlike some other movement abilities like this, it has no range requirements. So you can basically use it on turn one to get your free move to get those three attacks with the high damage profile in there. It also has a triple which is kind of like a net called hold them still. If you're within one inch of your opponent that opponent cannot make disengage actions so they're kind of stuck there for the rest of the turn. And on top of that what you're going to be doing is subtracting the value of the ability from your opponent's movement. So it's like a net but not like a net. So you should be able to run in there Use hold them still, keep the thing that you're fighting pinned up against you, and force them to attack you for a couple of rounds. Finally, he has a Resurrect. He's got the Nighthaunt Resurrect Spectral Summon. It allows you to bring back any one of your fighters. This has been affected by the FAQ that we had at the beginning of the year, so the fighter will no longer be able to do anything when he comes back. But it's very useful to use on turns two or turns three, where whichever fighter you bring back can then be used on turns three or four, depending on when you bring them back to the battlefield. Doing some list building for these guys, I quite like allying in Chosen of the King. 
Now we're going to talk about this a little bit later when we come on to Flesh Eater Quartz. Chosen of the King, it is a double that can be used by Crypt Haunters and it reads, fighter can only use this ability if they're within six inches of a visible friendly fighter with the Flesh Eater Quartz faction room mark and both the hero and the berserker room marks. So we're talking about Abhorrent Ghoul Kings and Arc Regents in this case. Um, and then until the end of the fighter's activation, you add two to the attack's characteristic of melee attack actions made by this fighter. But the Crypt Haunter itself gets uh, an additional two attacks. So he goes to 6, 4, 2, 5, which is extremely damaging. Um, it's on a 32 wound base, which I feel is very strong. And why are we using this? We can use our Beast Flayer Baron. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be having the Baron in the same deployment group as the Haunter and the Arc Regent. And then we can use the Baron's movement buff to push the Haunter and the Arc Regent into enemy fighters. And then we're going to use Chosen of the King as a double. And then suddenly we've got the Haunter and the Arc Regent, which can kind of bring their force to bear, hopefully from turn one instead of turn two when they would do normally. So I think that's pretty strong as a combo. It's not very dice intensive. So I think it's something that can be easily done and something that can be very versatile during your games. How are we supporting that? Well, we're going to be taking the Royal Flame Master. His damage is okay, so it's not terrible. Um, and we have several ghoul trackers, so we're going to run five of them. Because the Baron and Chosen of the King really revolve around your doubles, uh, that opens up your triples for other things. The Arc Regent, for example, he has a movement buff on a triple that he can use if he wants to boost the movement of other things. Or we can use the Flame Master and he can use his pack tactics, get a couple of ghouls in there, put some extra damage on. Overall, I think this is a pretty versatile list. It is nine fighters, so it's not exactly small, and it has a lot of damage concentration that you can put on the battlefield, hopefully from turn one, depending on how your deployment groups go. May haunt themselves. What are they? So they're a high mobility warband. They all have movement six, and they all have fly, which means they can basically get anywhere they want to on the board. They also have toughness four, which puts them squarely in the middle of warband's toughness. Most of them don't really go above 20 wounds if we're talking about the heroes themselves. And they have a bunch of eight wound fighters and a bunch of 10 wound fighters, but not all that much that's really viable in between. So we could say that they're a little bit fragile for the points cost you're paying and what they bring onto the table. Similarly, they effectively have a lack of damage. They got a lot of three strength, one, three damage profiles. They don't seem to have any of the really big heavy hitters that we see in other warbands. And that combination of low amount of damage, middling defense, and massive points cost because of the fly and the movement six really limits what they can do in your games and what you're able to bring. But, and there is a big but there, I think that with White Dwarf 490 coming out and the Divine Blessing rules, I think you can counter this somewhat with some smart list building. The way they're supposed to play is that you're meant to use your speed and overall toughness four to get your Night Haunt into combat with key opposing fighters tie them up for a bunch of turns and then the rest of your warband whilst those fighters are being tied up and not really doing all that much and not participating in the game you can go you can get your treasure you can go get your objectives and you're supposed to win the game that way it's a lot about movement and a lot about positioning and less about actually killing things i'm going to preface this by saying there are a lot of duds in night haunt they have a lot of units they have a lot of heroes a lot of them are really, really bad. I've picked out instead here a selection that I think have merit either by themselves through the, the abilities that they bring or using divine blessings to, in order to buff them to actual usefulness. The Dreadblade Harrow is kind of like your default choice when you're taking Night Haunt, especially if you are looking for an ally to bring in to Grand Alliance Death. It's much faster than the other choices that you can bring. And of course, it's got its Phantasmal Discorporation triple, which effectively allows it to teleport anywhere on the battlefield. It's pretty good. It's got 4424 damage profile, which is fine. It's not a massive amount of damage, but at least it's serviceable. It's paying, of course, for that movement 10 and for the fly remarks. But in reality, what you're actually taking it for is that teleport. You go, you get pieces of treasure, you get far-reaching objectives, and it's something that your opponent basically has very little play around for. 
Secondly, I'd like to bring your attention to the Briar Queen. It doesn't have an amazing amount of damage, but the real reason you're going to be bringing it is going to be for that Howling Vortex triple. And it's very simple. Pick a visible enemy fighter within nine inches of the Briar Queen, and nine inches is a long way when you have a five inch fly movement because you can go move, move 10, and then reach out and touch someone nine inches away from that. And then you roll a number of dice equal to the value of the ability. For each four plus, you do three damage points to that fighter. And then in addition, every time you do damage, you subtract one from that model's movement. Now, the ability itself, in terms of the amount of damage that you can do, is very similar to Horns of Hush Flame Hurlers. And we know that Flame Hurlers are good anyway. If you're rolling something like a triple six, you're doing on average nine damage to a fighter. So you can one shot a fighter from almost across the board using the Briar Queen. And if you don't one shot that fighter, you'll be stripping a whole bunch of movement out of it. Nowadays, I'd look to probably bring the Briar Queen over the Dreadblade Harrow if I was building my Nighthaunt lists. The entire Warband itself is movement six. So do you really need a fast objective grabber in an entire warband of fast objective grabbers? The jury's out on that, but personally, I would be looking to get more numbers in there instead of just slamming in a drop blade into every single one of my lists. All Nighthaunt heroes have the Spectral Summon triple. So you pick a fighter that's been taken down and you can reset up that fighter within three inches of the hero itself. And it comes back with as many wounds as the ability was. Of course, there's been a hit to summoning, so it's not as good as it used to be. Now fighters are going to be coming back, but they won't be able to activate. They won't be able to use any abilities. They'll basically have to sit there for a turn. So personally, I've been looking into some of the other triples, maybe the Howling Vortex off of the Briar Queen, maybe Phantasmal Discorporation from the Dripblade Harrow in order to use, instead of Spectral Summon, and only really use that as a last resort objective grabber where you can bring back fighters onto objectives to grab them at the end of the game or at the end of the turn. The reason why you would take Dread Wardens is because of the Chilling Horde double. Any fighter with the minion room mark can use Chilling Horde. So at the moment, it's basically only Dread Wardens or Chain Rasp. Chain Rasp are really, really bad. There's no real reason why you would want to take them. So if you are going to take Dread Wardens because of Chilling Horde, you're going to need to take two of them. And if you take two of them, what do you get? You get 125 points, you get 12 wounds, which is fine. You get Toughness 4, which is also fine for the 125 points that you're paying. They have a 3324 damage profile. Now, if you use Chilling Horde, what that gives you is a 4424 damage profile, which is actually really, really good for 125 points. It only has three inch range on it, so the Dread Wardens do have to stick together. So probably you're going to be putting them in the same deployment group and you're going to have to be very careful with your movement to make sure that you stick within that range. Otherwise, Dread Wardens kind of become bad, but it's definitely an option if that's something that you wanted to take. I mentioned before that we have Divine Blessings and Divine Blessings can be used to buff your units. And I think this is where we're going to be looking at for Nighthaunt in order to get that damage in. Because so far we've been lacking in damage. Either the Slasher Crone or the Lord Executioner become pretty good candidates. They get a good boost to their efficiency and they get a good boost to the amount of damage that they put out overall. So starting with the Slasher Crone is one of the more efficient heroes that you have in the list in terms of the amount of damage that it's doing, but it's really hampered by that strength three. So what that basically means is that if you have a high attack fighter going into an opposing chaff unit, they can just counter you. And most of the time you're going to miss and it's going to do damage back to itself. So what can we do to even this out a little bit? And my thoughts here are to give it the Blessing of Might. The Blessing of Might is plus one strength. The Slasher Crone goes to a 5424 4, 4 damage profile, which is suddenly vastly improved from what it is before. It, its average damage goes from 5.42 to 6.67, so almost seven points of damage, which is very good. And its average damage efficiency goes from 30.46 down to 27. Now, as a reminder, if you haven't seen any of my other videos on this topic, any fighter with a damage of efficiency of 25 or less falls in the top third of fighters in the game in terms of how efficient they are for the amount of damage that they're putting out in terms of how many points you're paying. So it's a massive improvement. The second option I've got here is the Lord Executioner. The real thing that's holding it back is those two attacks. So what can you do for that? You can give it the Blessing of Ferocity. Ferocity will cost you 25 points on your Lord Executioner, boosting it up to 200 points. But then look at his profile, 3536. That's the same damage profile as a Vargulf, and it's much cheaper than a Vargulf. But yeah, when you're sitting on three attacks 
Then you get to go in and you get to use your doubles on all the slots to go to four attacks. And four, five, three, six is more than enough to put a serious dent in most things in the game. And suddenly it gives you this really good, really strong damaging piece again with the fly, again with movement six, that allow it to go where it needs to be and really put some damage onto those fighters. It'll be able to knock them down fairly easily. Going into the fighters themselves, like I said before, there are a lot of duds in Night Haunt. So these are the ones that I would really be interested in. Starting with the Banshee and the Haridan. These are numerically speaking the most efficient fighters that Night Haunt have in terms of damage for the points you're paying. The Banshee is probably what you want. It is slightly overcosted, but it's a fairly solid fighter overall. Your other option is the Dread Scythe Haridan. It's much cheaper than the Banshee. It gets a bunch more attacks, but it loses a bunch of damage. So my general advice here is to take the Banshees, unless that you know that your local meta has a lot of toughness three. In which case, take the Dread Scythe Haridans because they'll do, they'll, they'll do real good work for you. The important thing about Dread Scythe Haridans is that they've got the Harrowing Shriek triple. So as a utility piece, it's pretty much okay. I think that the Dread Scythe is kind of expensive enough that you're not going to spam a whole bunch of them out like you would with other nets in other factions. So yeah, most of the time you want to take your Mimon Banshee. I do want to make a point about their Aura of Dread double. Now, all Night Haunt have this. Initially, when I was first playing Nighthorn, I looked at it and I thought, okay, this is garbage. But then I started using it, and turning Strength 4 fighters into Strength 3 fighters really does up the survivability of your Nighthorn. One point to note about Aura of Dread is that it works on attack actions. So your opponent can make ranged attack actions, or they can make melee attack actions at you. If they're under the effects of Aura of Dread, it means that everything will be at minus one strength. Talking about Divine Blessings, there are some fighters that I feel do benefit from them, either by being cheap enough to begin with that they can use Divine Blessing to up their survivability, or having some kind of gimmick that will work with one or more stats that they can boost. Starting with the Spirit Host. The Spirit Host generally is a very good fighter for Night Haunt. It's got good stats. It's got good survivability at 28 wounds, so it's less likely that it will be hit by counter and just lose all of its wounds and die. Those six attacks are strength three with one three. They do pile on. If you use Onslaught, get to seven attacks, you could go crit fishing all day, and maybe you can get one crit, maybe you can get two crits in order to do that damage. What they do have is a triple called Frightful Touch, and what Frightful Touch allows them to do is turn all hits into crits. Now, that's pretty interesting, because if you use the Blessing of Savagery to give them bonus crit damage, when they use that Frightful Touch, effectively all of their hits are going to be doing four damage, which is a lot of damage. Even if they're wounding on fives with their basic six attacks, those two hits are going to do eight damage to a thing, and that'll kill a chaff unit dead. If you get lucky in your rolls, you might be able to do 12 or maybe even 16 damage in one round of attacks, which combined with the natural 28 wounds of the Spirit Host means that whatever you're running into is going to take a bunch of damage and you'll be able to survive for next turn. Secondly, I'd like to talk about Glaive Wraith Stalkers, they are 90 points to begin with. A lot of people overlook Glaive Reef Stalkers because when you look at their profile, they aren't really all that fantastic. The point of comparison that I like to make Glaive Reef Stalkers with are Chain Rasp. For that extra five points, what do you get? You get two wounds, an extra point of crit damage, and an extra point of range on your attacks, which for five points I think is well worth it. And now what I want to do with Glaive Reef Stalkers is actually kind of live that Night Haunt dream where you can run into things hold them up, and the rest of your warband can go and do things that you need to do. And the way I've decided to do that is use the Blessing of Resilience on them. And they go from 90 up to 105 points, and effectively it gives them Toughness 5. The difference between a Toughness 4 10 wound fighter and a Toughness 5 10 wound fighter is really big. We can get around the relative lack of damage, basically because we now have access to counter. Most things in the game are going to be Strength 3, they're going to be Strength 4. So they're going to be wounding you on fives and effectively the stalk can run in there and it can counter all day long. Your opponent's going to be missing most of their attacks when you go up against them. They've got the 10 wounds, which makes them pretty resilient in themselves and they can be resurrected by your heroes. So yeah, I think that's the way to go with the core of your Nighthaunt list. I think with the toughest five, they are pretty good.
Since I recorded the original video, Games Workshop went and released the rules for Headsman's Curse in White Dwarf. This is one of the Warcry Bladeborn warbands. It mixes up a few things for the warband itself and how to build. So let's talk about that also. The Wielder of the Blade is the hero. You can see its profile is not terrible, 2536, so very similar to the profiles that we've seen before. We've got the script of the sentence at 115 points. He has a fairly weakish ranged attack at 2413, and then 3313 in combat. He does have 14 wounds, which isn't something that you see all that much in Night Haunt. But yeah, 115 points. I still think he is slightly overcosted for that amount. Bearer of the Block is is a little bit better. It's got 3424 four damage profile, 135 points, 16 wounds, which is also nice at something in Night Haunt, that, that points range. And finally, the Sharpener of the Blade, it's 80 points, very much similar stats to our Chain Rasp. But what we can see here, it's got that one attack at strength three, but one six damage, so huge crits. Now, what does this mean for us in terms of the actual stats? The Word of the Blade, as I've said before, same stats and same rune mark as the Lord Execution that we've seen already, but it does have its additional abilities being part of the Hesman's Curse. I think very much if you're going to be bringing a Lord Executioner, you should be taking the Wielder of the Blade instead. And then again, you can give it Ferocity, as we've already talked about, for the plus one strength. Costs exactly the same, but additional abilities. So it's a direct upgrade from the fighter that we already have. Similarly, with the Bearer of the Block, it has the exact same offensive stats as the Mime Worn Banshee at 3424. It is a little bit more expensive than a Banshee. Banshees are 120 points and this is 135. But what do you get for that? You get six more wounds, which is a really big step up, I feel, in terms of survivability. And you get access to the Hesman Curse abilities, which is something that the Banshee doesn't have because the Banshee has no additional rune marks for it to be able to use. The Sharpener of the Blade, it is five points cheaper than a normal Chain Rasp. So I feel like if you have the points left over and you were thinking about using Chain Rasp, then just bringing one Sharpener of the Blade instead of one of those, it'll save you a little bit of points and it won't really do anything adverse to your list building. Now I've said that they've got abilities, so let's check those out. Everyone has the Swift Judgment doubles. The interesting thing about this ability is that it's got no range on it. Some of these move abilities will say, pick an enemy fighter within six inches, for example, make your bonus move and finish closer to that fighter. Swift Judgment doesn't have that, which I feel is very good. It makes for a very good turn one double for you to be able to use, just to get those extra few inches of movement in there. They all have access to the hold still triple. So you pick an enemy fighter within one inch, that fighter cannot make disengage actions until the end of the battle round. And in addition, you subtract the value of this ability from that fighter's move characteristic to a minimum of zero. You don't really see all that many move debuffs, especially out of death. And you especially don't see one with a minimum move of zero. So I think it's fairly interesting. It's kind of like a net, but it's not really like a net. It's still on a triple. The comparable ability would be the Slasher Crone and the Dread Scythe Harridan, uh, which again is a triple. It is a net, but it only works on a three plus. Uh, it does have more range. It's got range equal to whatever the value of the ability is. But I feel like if you didn't want to bring those fighters specifically and you wanted to bring Wielder of the Blade and especially the Bearer of the Block, yeah, hold them still, I think is a fine, fine ability for them to have. I think overall, when you're, we're going to be taking a look at the army lists that are going to come up, anytime I talk about the Lord Executioner, you can substitute that in for the Wielder of the Blade. Anytime I talk about my Mon Banshees, you can put the Bearer of the Block in there if if the points are points are permitting. And anytime I talk about Chain Rasp, you can swap one out for the Sharpener, and I think you're generally going to be in good stead. So I've got a couple of lists here. The first one is basically the list I took to my first ever Warcry tournament. It went two and one. We were doing Corbett missions. I still stand by this list. It was a Slasher Crone, Dreadblade Harrow, a Vargulf Courtier, and three Dreadscythe Harridans. So really just using all of the most damage efficient units that were available to Nighthorn at the time. This is before Divine Blessings, remember? We were using a Vargulf Courtier to plug that damage problem that Nighthorn have. So we've got that 3-5, 3-5 damage profile, which is pretty good. The Vargulf has its triple that gives it a massive boost in attacks, which really helps boost its damage, which is great. A lot of wounds and decent movement. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a solid list. It's still a solid list. I think that... 
Warcry has kind of moved on a little bit in the last year in terms of how we play the missions and what missions that we're playing. So I think nowadays it might struggle a little bit, but it's still not absolutely terrible if you wanted to bring Night Haunt and to have a relatively decent chance of winning some games. The second list is for the Rumble Pack. This is a pure Rumble Pack list. So we're looking at lots of guys. We've got seven Chain Race Stalkers, two Chain Rasps, and a Briar Queen. The Briar Queen has to do a lot of heavy lifting in this using its triple. But the reality is what you're going to be doing is you're going to be flying about the place. You're going to be flying on top of platforms. You're going to be swooping down. You're going to be getting objectives and hopefully just surviving that way. There's a lot of taking the first hit and then disengaging and then using your six inch fly move to fly away in this in terms of how it plays. So it's very much not a, I'm going to do damage to your warband. It's a, I'm going to dance around and I'm going to win that way warband. I think for the rumble pack specifically, it's pretty good. It does have the 10 guys, which puts it on the higher end of the spectrum. Is it going to beat something like Soulblight Grave Lords? Probably not, but can it keep out of the way for long enough in order for it to do something? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Finally, this is the kind of list that I would bring if I was going to a tournament with them today in terms of all of the new stuff as to how we've learned how to play Warcry over the last year, how the meta has been shaping up, the missions themselves, the divine blessings, everything. So everything thrown at it. This is basically what I came up with. So we've got the Briar Queen because she's great with her triple. We've got the Ferocity Lord Executioner to put some proper damage on the field. We've got the Spirit Host as a nice anchor. And we've got four of our resilient Glaive Wraith Stalkers with the toughest five. It is a seven-man list. So for me personally, it's a little bit on the lower side, but there's only so much you can do when you're looking at 100-point fighters effectively across the board. A few points about it. I don't think that the Dreadblade Harrow is necessary anymore, given that effectively what we have is, like I said, a warband of fast objective grabbers, and the Dreadblade Harrow is a faster objective grabber. I don't think you need it, and I've used the points here just to get more numbers in. If you really did want your Dreadblade Harrow, there is one more hero slot. So you could probably drop two of your Glaive Wraith Stalkers to put, to put that back in. You'd go down to a six-man warband, but I think that the warband itself suffers if you try and do that. The Lord Executioner itself, just by itself without any dice put into it, it's got a better damage profile than the Vargulf that we were using before. The Vargulf is 3535 and the Executioner is 3536 and it's 185 points cheaper. So I really like the new Lord Executioner. I think it's a massive improvement from what we had before. And I'll be looking to take one, maybe two in every single one of my lists, simply because it's nice to have the ability to put targeted damage onto the battlefield. We've got those Toughness 5 Glaive Wraith Stalkers, so they do give a decent anchor to your warband and the ability to live that Night Haunt dream, run them into key enemy fighters and hold them up. We've talked already about the nerf to resurrection that there was in January, so what that effectively means is that you're not going to be using resurrection every turn, and so it opens up space for you to use your other triples, like the Briar Queen and Frightful Touch on your Spirit Host to really get those crits to do all the damage for you. Some alternatives that there could be, you could swap the Briar Queen for a second Lord Executioner if you wanted to go that route and have more dice-based damage as opposed to having more ability-based damage. You could swap the Briar Queen for a second Spirit Host if you wanted to be a little bit more tanky because the Spirit Host does have its 28 wounds as opposed to the 22 wounds of the Briar Queen. But again, the Briar Queen does have Toughness 5 and it's got the range attack. So personally, that's not something that I would be looking at doing. Alternatively, you can swap out your Glaive Wraith Stalkers for Dread Scythe Harridans if your play group is mostly Strength 3, because then they'll be winning you on 4s. You can use the massive amount of attacks off those Dread Scythe Harridans to kind of win your games against Chaff units for you. Okay, so the winner of round two was the Atagan True Blades. They're one of the newer Warcry factions. They were released in the third box of the Heart of Gur cycle. And they're really cool. They're, they're actually one of the more popular factions aesthetically that came out of the recent boxes for Warcry. And in terms of how they play, it's a very different play style from most other warbands. They are a mid-range all-vampire warband. And they're characterized by good movement. They all have movement five, apart from one or two of 
the fighters who have movement six, but also one of the big features about them is that they all have a low amount of attacks, but really high damage. So what we're going to be looking for are things that can maybe give extra actions or buff those attacks in some way to really kind of maximize the damage that each of those fighters can actually put out. And secondly, the, the other big thing they've got going for them is the Ask Again Exemplar. It's one of the best generic fighters in the Death Grand Alliance. So if you ever need just a fighter to use for damage, the Exemplar is a really good and really solid shout. It's only 205 points, so it's something that I would heavily recommend. Looking at the list of fighters available for the Eskian True Blades, there are only really three fighters that I find are quite outstanding, and the rest of them might have some other kind of niche uses, but in terms of damage potential and in terms of what I find utility on the battlefield, these are the three that I'd be looking at. We've got the Eskian Exemplar, as I've said already. It's got the highest damage potential in the entire warband with an average weighted damage of 8.5. Then you've got the Askagan Ascetic with Charnel Mace. There are two options for your aesthetics in terms of the weaponry. I prefer the mace because I think it has the most reliable damage profile at that strength 6 with the 3-4. I, I always like, say, 2-3 damage profiles or 3-4 damage profiles. I think it gives you a very clear idea of how much damage your fighter is going to do during your games. And it's really useful if you're trying to figure out how much damage something's going to do on the fly. And then finally, we've got the Asagan Acolyte with Throat Taker. I really like the Throat Taker. It's got a 3-inch range on its attacks so if you combine that three inch range plus its five inch move you're looking at an eight inch threat range which it's it's a long way on a war prey battlefield and it gives a really good zone of control for your throat taker it's 90 points which isn't exactly cheap like i said it is a war band of mid-range fighters but you've got the 12 wounds there which gives you some kind of survivability along with that three inch range it will keep you out of trouble for quite a while when you're playing your games now, something else to talk about whilst you're building a True Blades list is looking at the abilities. I find that most of the abilities themselves are highly situational. Beast Familiar on the Pariah is probably the best utility ability that you've got in there. It's essentially a targeted 20-inch range, no disengage ability. So depending on the kinds of build that you have and the kind of build that your opponent is running, I could see it as being useful, but it isn't something that I would go out of my way to build with. Secondly, you've got Terrifying Howl on your Cursed Blood. Cursed Blood is the big dog vampire that you also get in the set. It's fine. It's got a 3-inch range, and within that 3 inches, no one can react so this can be quite strong i think depending on the opponent if you're playing against a warband that likes to counter a lot for example maybe you're playing against osiarch bone reapers turning off all of their reactions and forcing them just to use their base damage can actually be quite strong but i think that 190 points for the cursed blood puts it just out of reach where you would just want to just throw one into one of your lists, especially when you're going to be using the exemplars anyway to do the damage that you need to do. So I've got a couple of lists that I put together here. One is for pure True Blades. It's probably how I would be looking to run them. I've said before that the abilities themselves are too situational. So what you're effectively going to be doing is looking at the best fighters in your list and building something around that. You've got the two Askagan exemplars where you can see it. The strength six damage and the four six damage profile. It's really something that you can build around. And just as a generic fighter, it's very, very good. I've got here two ascetics with the mace just because i like the mace and it does the most damage out of the two ascetic builds and then i've got four throat takers the four throat takers with that three inch range will really be able to get places onto the battlefield use that range to keep themselves safe and to bully other chaff off of objectives so because the range is so high you'll be able to contest an objective with your throat taker be out of melee range of whatever else is contesting that objective, but still be able to attack. And I find that extremely valuable for them. And uh, yeah, that's why that's why I've got four of them in here. Now, the second list I've got for you is really, it, it's barely a True Blades list, but you know, it's it's legal as an Ask Again True Blades warband. It's got the two exemplars again, because they have a lot of damage. But here I'm using effectively all of the exile dead. We've got Dean Telos the Exile, Prentice Markov, Regulus, Ion, Coil, Bolt, and Vlash. And um, what we're using them for is to add the numbers to the exemplar's damage profiles. I think the zombies themselves are actually really good value because they're able to get more attacks off of Dintelos's unique ability and also off of Van Hell's Dance Macabre. 
And what it also allows you to do is open up Soul Blight Grave Lord Resurrection tricks. All the zombies themselves, they'll have the minion rune mark. So you're able to bring them back to life once they die. They are zombies, so they're slightly more survivable than your basic skeleton. And they'll have move four, which is interesting. So they're able to get places a little bit more quickly than than your other Soul Blight Gravelord units might, uh, might otherwise be able to. If you wanted to expand this out a little bit, I was talking about the Cursed Blood with its no reaction ability. I think that might be pretty interesting in this kind of list. Maybe if you wanted to run one Exemplar and a Cursed Blood, because the majority of those zombies only have Strength 3, they are very vulnerable to counter. But if you did run the Cursed Blood in there, pop its ability, and then start attacking with zombies, your opponent wouldn't be able to counter. So you'll effectively take less damage than you would do normally. And I think that's something that, that might be interesting. That is it for my big summary of list building for all the death factions. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that it was something that is useful to you. As I said before, if you like what you see and you want more content like this, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And let me know. Let me know down in the comments section below what you think about any of the topics that I've covered here today. If you have any interesting builds for your death factions that you want to share, I'm more than happy to hear it. Um, if you've been having some great exploits with your death factions on the battlefield, and on the tabletop of Warcraft, that's something that I would also love to hear. But yes, thank you very much for watching. I've been Itan, this has been Off Meta Musings, and I will see you next time.